Well, hey, everybody, I'm Dave, and I just want to thank you for joining us, whether you're watching us online or listening to our podcast. It means the world to me how so many of you are working to stay connected with the church. Even though we're an online church for this season, I just it means the world to me. And, and if you are watching right now and uh, you're on Facebook, I would love, it would, it would just be so fun if you would take a picture of kind of your environment or you watching and just post it in the comments or you can just post it on the Facebook page. If you're on Instagram, just tag us. It's just so encouraging to know that even though we're not gathered in a building, we're still the church, right? We've always said the church isn't a building, but now it is time that uh, we're seeing that come to fruition, that reality. Uh, so if you missed the first part of our online service today, we mentioned that we're receiving communion at the end. So I want you to make sure you have a cracker ready, a piece of bread ready, French toast, waffle. I don't care what you get. Have something to eat, including fruity pebbles, if that's meaningful to you. And then uh, get something to drink, water, juice, if you're a stay-at-home parent and you've been with little kids all week, maybe you're on your second glass of wine, keep that wine around. We're gonna receive communion at the end. I, I can't believe this, but it has been three weeks already of quarantine. And I'm, I'm going stir crazy, right? In fact, the reason I'm standing this week and not sitting is just because I started to lose my mind sitting too much. Um, as you can probably tell, I haven't shaved for three weeks. And if we can go another couple years, I am going to produce for you a beard. Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to have some sort of beard someday if this continues. Uh, but right now, for the foreseeable future, it looks like through the month of April, we're going to be an online church. And many of you are going to be safer at home during the month of April. So here's my encouragement. Get a bunch of hand sanitizer, right? Mm, we, wanna, we just want to keep using up this stuff. Um, Get a snack that you really, really enjoy. You got to keep those around the house. Collect, stock up on supplies. Don't hoard, but stock up. And then, of course, all of us need time to just slow down, rest, reflect, and watch seven episodes of Tiger King. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've not seen this documentary on Netflix, you have to do it. We say all the time that Jesus loves everybody. But I got to tell you, the, the people in this documentary, they push the limits of what that love does, I think. I'm just like, these are some of the craziest people I have ever seen. Uh, but put all that aside, here's the deal. Uh, we're in a season right now that almost nobody's traveling. Uh, but back in the good old days, remember like five weeks ago, six weeks ago, when we could travel anywhere, uh, people would travel regularly. I, I know personally, I would get on a plane about once a month. I've, I've got things going on all the time and always traveling. I am not a world traveler, though. I, I mostly stick to the States. Uh, but that being said, I have been in Mexico. I've gone to England. I've also gone to, uh, been to Canada, right? And then, of course, I've been to developing countries, uh, Haiti, uh, the Dominican Republic, um, Kentucky, been there as well. And, and you know this, especially if you travel a lot, that different countries and different locations, you can walk in and very quickly realize there's a cultural disconnect from your upbringing and your background to what you're experiencing. And, and that varies based on where the place is. A cultural disconnect happens when I've always thought this way, I've always been trained this way, everybody around me does it, but now I'm in an environment where, where that's not normal. So maybe you've traveled to different parts of the world where you realize not everybody has an American toilet. Like if you had to squat and use a squatting toilet, yeah, it's not so fun. I remember my first time in England, I did not realize that there were different outlets. And so I didn't have any adapters. I had to borrow from my friends in order to keep things charged up. Uh, there are places in the world that, in my opinion, drive on the wrong side of the road, right? Uh, they, I, I'm so used to driving on the right side of the road, but they drive on the left side of the road. Uh, there are parts of the world that serve chicken feet as part of a menu. Guys, we can't go to Chick-fil-A or KFC and, and ask for chicken feet. They just don't sell it. It's like uh, when I went to Haiti for the first time, I didn't bring any cash. I just brought a credit card. I didn't realize you can't use a credit card at like different stands and different uh, restaurants in, in, in Haiti. They just weren't set up that way. Uh, just another big disconnect uh, from how I grew up. I grew up believing in the tooth fairy, right? The tooth fairy is a big deal. You lose your tooth, you put it under your pillow, tooth fairy comes and takes it. Well, in many Spanish speaking countries, they don't have a tooth fairy. They have a tooth mouse. Perez. And here's the way Perez works. 
Uh, you, you take your tooth, you put it in a glass of water. Perez comes in the middle of the night, drinks the water, and then takes your tooth. And of course, we could just go all day long with examples of uh, different cultures and why it's easy to experience a cultural disconnect. And the reason I bring this up is one of the symbols of our faith, a really big symbol, is the cross. And I'm assuming you know this, but in the 21st century, how we view, how we look at the cross is very different than how it was viewed 2,000 years ago. Because for us, crosses are very artistic, right? We, we see crosses in paintings. We see them in jewelry, in artwork. Uh, we see them as basically decorations uh, that we have around the house. And, and they're just part of pop culture, which is why celebrities can wear crosses around their neck. I mean, many, many celebrities, and it's not necessarily a sign of their faith. It's just a cool piece of jewelry. So Madonna, uh, about 15 years ago, had this tour called the Confessions Tour, brought in like $194 million. And at the end of each of her concerts, she would be crucified on a disco cross. It was a mock crucifixion. And you can imagine there's a bunch of controversy over it. And so she responded. She said, wait a minute, if Jesus was alive today, he would be totally comfortable with doing something like this. And, you know, the way I think and process it, and I'm not, you know, booing Madonna, but I, I cannot foresee Jesus being crucified on a disco cross, bringing in $194 million. That kind of wasn't his style. But we're so used to the cross being part of our culture that I think we lose some of the shame and some of the horror and, and some of the suffering behind it. Because it really is a symbol of suffering and shame. And so what I wanna to do today is just give you an overview, a little bit of history of the cross. Which means we're not gonna be doing a whole bunch of laughing, right? I'm not gonna be telling you all these dramatic stories and having fun with you in, in, in that kind of way. But it's gonna be more of a somber uh, type of reflection. Because when you think about the Roman Empire, crucifixion was a part of the way they executed people for like 600 years. So from the time of Alexander the Great all the way up into Constantine in the early 300s, crucifixion was very common. And this is interesting because Rome knew how to kill people. If they wanted to do it cheaply, they could uh, stone you, they could burn you alive. And they did that all the time. If they wanted to do it quickly, they would just take a sword and execute you. They did that, right? If they wanted to do it quietly and privately, they, they could do that. Socrates died because he dra drank hemlock poison in front of some family and friends. So Rome knew how to execute people. And yet in the many forms of execution, they chose to, uh, many forms of execution, they, they chose to use crucifixion as one of their methods. And the question I have is why, right? It, it required a lot of soldiers. It took a lot of time. It required a bunch of moving pieces to be orchestrated and come together in, 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 you know, in order to pull it off. Um, you know, very expensive. So, so why crucifixion? Well, crucifixion was used whenever Rome wanted to maximize pain and humiliation. So it was not common for Rome to execute through crucifixion its own citizens. They used it primarily with slaves and with enemies of Rome. In fact, you might remember uh, the great warrior Spartacus. Spartacus led a rebellion against Rome. Eventually, he dies in one of the battles. And then what Rome does, because they want to make a point, don't mess with us. They take 6,000 of the men who had been part of this rebellion and they crucified them on crosses that lined up for like 120 miles along one highway. So imagine from Kenosha to Madison, just crosses everywhere, crucifixion after crucifixion. And, and, and crucifixions weren't done in these remote areas and faraway places. What they, wh wh where they took place was in main thoroughfares. This was more than just execution. This was a billboard to the world. Don't mess with us. We are mighty and we are powerful. And so they killed thousands and thousands of individuals this way. In fact, in the first century, um, mass crucifixions were very common. You could Google it and learn about different mass crucifixions. Just one example, around 70 AD, as Rome was starting to occupy Jerusalem, they, were, they had seized, seized the city and uh, they, they were taking control. At, at one point, as they were occupying the city, they were crucifying up, uh, up to uh, 500 Jews a day for months at a time. And eventually it stopped because they ran out of wood. 
And so crucifixions were, were common. And yet what's fascinating is apart from the crucifixion of Jesus, the cross would really just be in the history books. We might come across one at a museum. We, we really would have very little attachment to it. And yet today all over the world, we have crosses, right? They're on chapels. They're a part of our architecture. They're in our jewelry. They're a part of our decorations and paintings, the whole thing. Why is that? Why is the cross such a big deal? Now, to answer that question, we have to remember there's a disconnect from how we see crosses and how they were viewed a couple thousand years ago. Matter of fact, after Jesus was crucified for for like 300 years after that, church leaders forbid anyone to paint or draw pictures of the cross in an artistic form. And the reason why is because all of these church leaders had seen with their own eyes crucifixions of people. They knew it wasn't glamorous and it wasn't romantic and there was really nothing artistic about it. The author C.S. Lewis says this about crucifixion. He says, crucifixion did not become common in art until all who had seen a real one died off. So crucifixion was very shameful. But then when you think about the paintings and the drawings and the architecture we have for, you know, really throughout history, you don't really see this portrayal of shame and humility. What, what you see in many of the artistic expressions is Jesus at peace on the cross. You see these quaint and quiet and serene type of settings. It's just kind of fascinating. You know, one of the first realistic paintings we have of the crucifixion is from the 1800s. A Russian artist, Nikolai Guy, took the time to show the horror and the humiliation and the pain behind the crucifixion. Notice that there aren't any halos on Jesus' head. According to some historians, the oldest picture we have of Jesus is from the early 200s. It was etched in plaster on a wall. And it was graffiti. So it, it wasn't a painting with beautiful brushes and beautiful scenery. It was uh, this graffiti on a wall that pretty much mocked followers of Jesus. And it's known as Aleximenos graffiti because the letters etched in the wall say Aleximenos worships his God. And apparently Aleximenos is raising his hand in allegiance to Christ. Now, do you notice the head of Christ? It's a donkey's head. The implication is that any God that comes to earth and dies on a cross is really a jackass. Constantine said it was an embarrassment that his savior would die on a cross. The apostle Paul in one of his letters in the first century, he acknowledges this. Like he realizes this isn't normal. This is gonna be looked at as ridiculous. And so he even says to some, the message of the cross is foolishness. Yeah, when you look at a God who seems weak and powerless and can be overpowered by others, that does seem foolish. And then, then let's just step back. Crucifixions involved way more than just hanging someone on a cross. They started with beatings. The soldiers had a whip with different leather straps that had stones and glass and bone and, and metal attached to them. And, and they would whip the person being crucified. Sometimes they would bleed so profusely that they would die before the crucifixion started. And so they would have to time this right. They would give them a cross beam to carry through the main areas of town so they could gather a crowd and people would see all this excitement and energy. Someone would walk in front of the person being crucified with a sign that said, hey, this is what the person did. This is what they're guilty of. Then they would get to the place of crucifixion. The person being crucified would be uh, laid down on pieces of wood. Four to nine inch spikes would go through their, their wrist or through their feet. And then the cross would be propped up and people would mock, they would spit, they would humiliate the person hanging on the cross. Well, as you can imagine at this point, the person hanging starts to lose control of their bodily functions. And so often they would urinate the person on the cross. Uh, they would urinate, they would defecate on themselves. They would uh, sweat profusely. And, and it would last for hours. Sometimes it would last for days, but often it was hours and eventually they would suffocate to death. Sometimes they would bleed to death, but often it was through suffocation. And so my question to you is, why would Jesus choose to die that way? 
Now, to answer that question, we have to go back to the earliest parts of civilization. We have to remind ourselves that early on in human history, the way that ancient cultures and civilizations thought was they, they, they really believed that the future was determined by forces outside of their control. So wind and fire and drought and earthquakes and famines and hurricanes, all that stuff was outside of their control. And, and so what they wanted to do was, was attach themselves to those forces in some way. And what they did is they gave personalities and names and human characteristics to those, uh, to those forces and they became gods and goddesses. And people believed we're dependent on these gods and goddesses for our well-being. And so you had the God of thunder. You had the sky God, the God of lightning. You had the God of the waters and the God of the air. And so throughout ancient history, humans did their best to try to keep these gods and goddesses happy. And they'd set up altars on mountains or hills. They tried to be as close to the gods or goddesses as possible. And then they would offer sacrifices. Often they would offer animals, uh, but they would take parts of their harvest. They would sacrifice that as well. If they had a good harvest, they would take an abundant amount of that harvest and say, we are so thankful for what you bless us with. If it was a bad harvest, they would still take part of that harvest, as little as it was, and they would sacrifice it and say, can we be okay with you? We know we've made you mad. We know we made you upset and we want to make things right. And this just was a vicious cycle that humans were in. It was very much built into the psyche of humans that we've got to keep the gods and goddesses okay. And, and if it felt like things didn't get better, their situations didn't improve, they didn't have better harvest, then they would go to extreme. On one occasion, we learned that there were three to 4,000 men trying to appease the gods and the goddesses. So they castrated themselves. Then they took the part they castrated, placed it on the altar at the temple of Sybil. If you want to test your commitment to something, castrate yourself, dudes. And that, that's just crazy. And then just other extremes. Archaeologists have found the remains of children at many religious sites, which just showed that parents sacrifice their children to get attention of the gods. Now, I know if you've been trapped inside and been sequestered and quarantined with your kids for the last couple of weeks, you've probably been tempted to sacrifice those kids on occasion. But at the end of the day, that's extreme. But they really believe that this is how we get the attentions of God and goddesses. And they learned over time, no sacrifice is ever going to be good enough. Now, to me, what's fascinating is that when we read about the God of the Jewish people and our God, throughout Jewish history, God actually required sacrifices and offerings of them. He said, this is how you can be made right with me. This is how you can be made right with people. And it's fascinating because it seems very primitive and barbaric. But this is how the Jews knew that they could be okay with God. It's actually kind of revolutionary because at least they could have peace. If we do this, God's going to be okay with us. Well, over time, the system of sacrifices grew into a big machine. There was a temple built. There were altars. There were priests who went on different rotations. Uh, a, a very big system was developed. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, this is how the Jewish people operated. And then we read about the final week Jesus was on this planet, like the week of his death. Uh, and it was the Passover festival. A couple hundred thousand people, anywhere from 200 to 400,000 people had made their way to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices. So just imagine outside the temple, you got miles and miles of people. They're all holding animals. Uh, one Jewish historian says that there were like 250,000 lambs sacrificed on that particular week. You've got blood running down the temple, blood running down the sides of the hill into the Kidron Valley. Just a very, very messy uh, situation. And it just makes me step back and say, say, ask this. What kind of God requires violence and bloodshed in order for you to be at peace with him? Like, why does God need that? And then we read through some of the ancient scriptures and it's pretty clear that God actually didn't need animal sacrifices. In Psalm chapter 50, the author makes this observation and actually writes on behalf of God. He says this, I have no complaint about your sacrifices or the burnt offerings you constantly offer. But I do need, but, but, but I do not need the bulls from your barns or the goats from your pens for all the animals of the forest are mine and I own a, the cattle on a thousand hills. So God says, 
hey, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you have these sacrifices and I'm glad you're going through these rituals. I don't need it for it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So God doesn't need animal sacrifices. But God chose to work within our culture. He chose to work within first century systems and their way of thinking. God knew as humans, we're always going to be insecure in where we stand with God. He, he knew, knew we're always going to feel a little restless. We're going to deal with our guilt and we're going to deal with our shame. And, and so God created this system for our benefit, not for his. 30 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, the author of Hebrews writes this, under the old covenant, under the old way of doing things, under Jewish law, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest, it's a reference to Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Now don't miss this. Jesus was the final sacrifice, good for all time. Most people don't really believe that. Because most people, when they do something that falls short of their own standards or they're convinced falls short of God's standards, they start getting insecure again. And they wonder, am I in or am I out? But Jesus was a single sacrifice, the final sacrifice, good for all time. John, a disciple of Jesus who spent years around him, as he looks back and he reflects on the cross, here's what he writes. Jesus himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. So let me ask you again, what kind of God would come up with a system that required the death of his own son? He's God. He could have done anything he wanted. He could have created any system he wanted, but he chose to enter our systems, kind of our way of thinking. Now, the apostle Paul, in a letter he writes in the first century to followers of Jesus in Rome, he kind of pulls back the curtain. He gives us a little insight. Here's what Paul writes. He says, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness for he himself is fair and just. And he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. In other words, when we transfer our confidence and our faith from ourselves to Jesus, he declares us right in his sight. Now this is big. And Paul references this, references this in the verse, but it's easy for us to overlook. He says, when talking about God, that God is both fair and just. God does not simply dispense justice. He is justice. And Paul says, the reason Jesus chose to die the way he chose to die, a very dramatic, a very bloody death, a very uh, visible sign to the world, is because God is pure justice. In other words, when there's sin, when there's wrongdoing, when, when, when there's fault, somebody has to pay. Now, you and I, we can let people off the hook because we're not pure justice. We're not full justice. So I can say it's no big deal. Don't, don't worry about it. You can say the same to me. But God can't do that. God is complete justice. In other words, somebody has to pay. And, it's, and, it, and as humans, it's just so hard to wrap our mind around that. We don't have the space to really comprehend why our lie or us taking something from somebody or us verbally abusing somebody or putting somebody down, like, what's that? That's not that big of a deal, right? If I think of all the wrong things that I've done in my life, I, I'm not convinced I could go to jail. I don't know that I've ever done something so illegal that I'm gonna spend a night in jail. I, it's not like I got a halo on my head, but that's just the reality. This last week, I was talking to my buddy, Jeremiah. He was telling me about his son, Liam. Uh, by the way, uh, my alarm just went off as a reminder as a reminder that I'm supposed to film the talk I'm filming right now to you. So guess what? I'm filming a little bit early. Uh, so here's the deal. Um, Jeremiah tells me about his son, Liam. And uh, bottom line is Liam took a camera from his older brother, didn't tell him, went and was filming and playing around and dropped it in the creek with some of his friends this week. So Jer fished it out of the creek, but of course it's ruined. And Liam is five years old. He doesn't understand why it's a big deal. He said, dad, it's just a camera. Get another camera. And Jeremiah looked at him and said, uh, the camera costs $400. And Liam, with his five-year-old mentality, looks at Jer and he says, how do you have $400? Isn't that the way kids think? And I think that's like us with God, right? God, how in the world do you have $400? How in the world do you have $500? How in the world? God, how, how do you 
think and operate so differently from us. But God in his justice says somebody has to pay. And we say, well, if that's true, then why do you let so many injustices happen around the world? But as we learn more and more about the character of God, what we realize is that God is a merciful God. And in his mercy, he can allow sin, he can allow wrongdoing to go unpunished for a season. He can let it go unpunished for a little while, but eventually somebody has to pay. And in his grace, he says, I'm going to pay on your behalf. Do you want to know why Jesus died? It's because God is just. If you ever doubt the justice of God, don't look at your circumstances, look at the cross. Our heavenly father is so committed to justice. He's so committed to wrongs being dealt with that he sent Jesus to make sure it was taken care of. So God says, in my mercy, I can allow sin and wrongdoing to go unpunished for a while. But in my justice, I'm going to ensure that somebody eventually has to pay. And in my grace, Jesus is going to pay for what others did. Now, I'm going to say it one more time. And if you've got a camera or you just want to take a screenshot of this, I'd encourage you to do it. God's mercy allows sin to go unpunished for a while. God's justice ensures that eventually someone has to pay. God's grace is Jesus paying for what others did. And so at the cross, we realize what a big deal our sin, our wrongdoing is. And at the same time, we see the mercy of God and the grace of God. And so the apostle Paul reflecting on the cross writes this. He says, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. He says, we can be made right with God. But in order to do that, we need to transfer trust from ourselves to God. We, we got to come to the point where we say, I'm never going to measure up to my own standards. I'm only, always going to fall short of God's standards. So I put my faith in Jesus. This is why I've encouraged you through the years. If someone calls you a hypocrite, if Christians are hypocrites, you say, absolutely. We, we say we want to do this and we don't always follow through, which is why we need Jesus. If we could fix our life and we could do everything right, we wouldn't need Jesus. Now, I know that sounds foolish. I know that sounds ridiculous. It's almost embarrassing. It's like it's that easy, just transfer faith to Jesus. That's why Paul writes, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. In 1863, there was a slave in South Carolina by the name of Gordon, severely beaten by his overseer. Thankfully, he escapes the plantation he's working on and he finds freedom. And when he finds freedom, one of the abolitionists takes a picture of his scars that were on his body. It was horrific. An abolitionist who saw this picture they decided to reproduce it and they decided to bring it to different parts of the country and they decided to print it in different newspapers because they wanted to get the word out. The reality is most people, when it came to slavery, they weren't involved in slavery themselves, but if they were honest, they had become indifferent. And, and their attitude was that if someone owns slaves, that's between them and their slave. That's between them and God. I, I'm not gonna get involved in that. But this picture, it starts to circulate and the message becomes clear. You can't be indifferent. You've got to respond at some level. And so people started seeing these scars of an innocent man and they started to just say all over the country, this has got to stop. This has got to stop. This cannot continue. And that really is what the cross is. It's a picture that's meant to move us to repentance, to move us to a point of saying, we can't continue to live like we've lived. There's got to be a change. There's got to be something that happens in us. And yet we know how fruitless it is to try to, fix everything ourselves. And so we find a way to transfer our faith from ourselves to what Jesus, who Jesus is and what Jesus is, what Jesus did. And if you've never done that, I invite you to do that. To just simply say, Heavenly Father, I transfer trust and confidence from me to you. I choose to follow you and be a part of your kingdom. I'm not going to live for my life for myself anymore. I invite you to place your hope in Jesus and his death on the cross for forgiveness of sins once and for all. I did that as a young kid. But I got to tell you, it was in my early 20s, in my mid-20s, actually, where I came to really understand what it meant to not have to live with the insecurity of am I in or am I out? And if you've always lived with insecurity, I encourage you to pray in your heart, Heavenly Father, I choose to follow you. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name that anyone 
who, as they're listening to me right now, or as they're watching on video, who wants to become a follower of yours, would in this very moment become just that. They'd become your follower. They would receive your mercy and your grace into their life and would live with confidence that our sins have been forgiven once and for all, past, present, and future. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, or maybe you have something in your heart that you just say, man, I need prayer for, I'd encourage you to go to greatlakeschurch.com uh, slash CC for connection card. Greatlakeschurch.com slash CC. And just let us know. Fill out a, a connection card. Let us know that you made a decision to follow Jesus. We'd love to connect with you just via email. Promise you we're not gonna call you. We're not gonna show up at your door. Um, also, I encourage you at this moment to stick around and uh, Pastor Rex and Crystal are gonna lead us in communion. So let's transfer over to them.